All right, this is a test. Oh, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> hi, I hope everyone had a nice lunch. Um, if you went to Langer's, I'm particularly jealous. Um, welcome to the afternoon portion of Saturday at WG Festival. Um, I'm behind this curtain, but I was going to say it's nice to see so many new and familiar masked faces out there. Um, and virtually, too. We appreciate you showing up. Um, you're listening now to Lauren O'Connor. I'm a librarian at the Writers Guild Foundation Library, and I'm here to introduce our first afternoon session, which is Fundamentals of the Comedy Pilot. Your host is Brent Forrester, who has spent 25 seasons in some of the biggest comedy writers' rooms, like The Simpsons, The Office, King of the Hill, Space Force, and Love. Um, and I hope you are as stoked uh, to get his insights into what makes a good comedy pilot as I am. I heard him described as a national treasure earlier, so uh, please give it up for national treasure, Brent Forrester. <laughs> What is happening? Writers, writers everywhere. Hello, writers. You know, they made me write my own blurb for this event, and I promised a lively and interactive hour. <laughs> All right, you guys know me. I will bring the lively, but I need the interactive from you. So let me ask you from the start, are you feeling lively? <laughs> How very interactive of you. All right, we're off to a good start. Let's, let's start on a serious note. You know, uh, you're writers. You guys like words, I presume? Uh, but let's notice something. You know, words can divide us. You cannot be both a progressive and a conservative. Words can divide, but words can also unite, right? A progressive and a conservative can both be writers. And we are all writers here, and there are writers all around the world watching us right now. And let's pull together under this word, because the truth is, Writers are a certain kind of marginal person, all right? You know that. We're weirdos. We are a minority for sure. And when we meet each other, let us meet in a spirit of support yeah. and generosity and giving, and let this be part of that, all right? What do we do as craftspeople? We share secrets of the craft, all right? We go around collecting secrets, and when we meet other writers, we share those secrets. So that is what I'm going to do for you tonight for sure. And I'm going to ask you guys to share some of your secrets too if you have any. All right, so let's begin. You know, the big secret about me as a writer is that uh, I really for sure knew less than anybody here about writing TV comedy coming up. Because in fact, I grew up in a home where my mom hated television. She would not allow TV in the house. I did not watch TV growing up. I read books. Uh, and especially short stories. And I was a short story nerd, okay? I went to college and I took all the short story classes and then I graduated and I discovered that nobody's really reading short stories anymore, <laughs> all right? They're all watching TV. Thanks, Mom. Uh, I'm one giant medium behind when I graduate from college, all right? And I was desperate, like uh, anybody who's graduating college now is, uh, to get a job. I thought, okay, I know something about writing. Are there other jobs in writing? I would have become a journalist. Uh, I would have become a soap opera writer. I took a class in soap opera writing, okay? Uh, I was not a comedy writer, uh, but I had no connections anywhere except a friend of mine from high school, his mom was a comedy writer. And so I said, can I get into this business? And that is when I started watching TV and started watching comedy and trying to learn about it. So I was a neophyte in this craft as a college graduate. I tell you that because hearing my credentials now, I obviously learned how to do it. This is a craft that can be learned, for sure. As many of you in this room have already learned the craft, and many of you watching are learning it, and I and you, are we are all still learning this craft. Okay, let me tell you something uh, more about this journey as it relates to the half-hour comedy pilot. Because my story, you know, how it begins, um, I learned that I had to write a spec script. I tried writing spec scripts. I got them to my friend's mom, my connection. She got me on a cruddy uh, multicam show in the dying era of the uh, uh, multicam boom. It was a show called Nurses. It was pretty lousy even for its time. And I was fired from that staff. The whole staff got canned, okay? All right, that was my introduction to TV but I learned enough just watching the veteran writers to learn how to write a good spec script. I wrote a good Roseanne. 
I got that into the hands of other young writers that I was meeting in LA. Uh, one of my friends got my script to a young producer uh, named Judd Apatow who was creating a show called The Ben Stiller Show. Judd was 25, Ben was 26. They liked my Roseanne, they hired me. Uh, I worked there for six months before the show was canceled, but in cancellation, the show got nominated for an Emmy and we all won. I now had an Emmy and about eight months experience in TV. Okay? <laughs> With my Emmy, I got hired on The Simpsons as a young writer there and managed to hang around on that staff for a few seasons long enough to learn the craft of writing half-hour comedy. By the end, I felt confident that I could deliver a script that had a good story and enough jokes, and I was a competent uh, craftsperson in the craft of writing half-hour comedy for an existing show. And I went on to do that more. I went on to write for King of the Hill. Uh, I did feature rewrite work. I came back to TV for The Office. I was at The Office for seven seasons, learning more, honing the craft. And you know, by the end of my years at the office, I felt very confident you could assign me a script, I could write it competently. Many of you are there already, many of you are on your way to that kind of competence. But here's the thing, if you do that long enough, if you write for staff long enough, you get a reputation for writing half hour comedy, eventually someone's gonna hire you to write a pilot. Okay, now here is the thing, I got hired to write pilots many times. Did anybody watch the great Brent Forrester show that's sweeping the nation? There is none! Brenty failed. <laughs> Brenty has failed so far to write a hit comedy show. Now, look, I am not alone in this. <laughs> Most professional writers who are good at writing a half hour comedy will stumble on their first attempts at writing a pilot. Most never do it. One of my favorite writers, Mike Reese, uh, he's a, a comedy writer from, uh, from The Simpsons, Harvard guy, genius. I asked him about writing a pilot. He said, Brent, how many hundreds of writers have come through The Simpsons? They're all good. How many of them have successfully developed a pilot? Maybe two, Greg Daniels with uh, King of the Hill and The Office, David X. Cohen with Futurama. Most have failed. Now, why is that? Are they not good writers? No, they're great writers, all of them. Okay, is it possible that writing the pilot is harder than writing an existing half hour for a TV show that's already a hit. Uh, what do we think, writers? Which one is harder? <laughs> it's a pilot. It's the pilot. Yes, that's why you're here. Okay, now, this is where we're gonna try to share some knowledge. Now, I have my thoughts, uh, after having beefed it enough times, uh, and having tried to figure out why, I have my thoughts on what make for the fundamentals of a successful TV pilot. But let's see uh, if we can just try to answer the question of why is the pilot harder? Does anybody have a feeling for that? Any, any ideas at all of why the pilot uh, might be more difficult to do? Um, has anybody here tried to write a pilot? Show of hands, anybody tried to write a pilot? Oh my gosh, okay, great, okay, great. Um, uh, somebody tell me a challenge you had. Why is it more difficult to write the pilot than it is to write the existing half hour? Yes, sir. Finding an original voice versus a pre-existing voice from the show kind of like, it, it's harder to capture that and then you're trying to engage an audience that you have no way of predicting how they're gonna receive what you're writing. I mean, that's great, there's a mouthful right there. You're creating something original as opposed to imitating something that already exists and works, that's great. Um, are there elements of the pilot that are different than the existing half hour? Uh, anybody else who wrote a pilot here, did you have any kind of struggles? Yes, my friend. Well, people like what they like, so mm -hmm. when you bring them something new, the first reaction is, why the hell should I read this? Oh, I already wow. like what I like. What a brilliant insight there. Yes, and you know, this is particularly true when trying to sell something. Think about this. Uh, if you had a uh, million dollars, and it was your only million dollars, and I said, I want you to, uh, to invest this, would you like to invest in something risky and original, or something that's pretty tried and true and has worked before? Probably tried and true. Of course you would, of course you would. So, the people who are investing money are very inclined to go with what is safe and what has worked before. Interestingly, however, the audience is the opposite. If I say to the same guy, hey, we're gonna go out and see a show tonight, you wanna see something that's kind of similar to what we've seen a bunch of times, or something totally new and original? Sure. Of course, the audience and the investor are actually at odds, right? One is conservative, one is risky. I'm not really risking anything if I see something original, but if I invest in something original, I am. These are great points. Uh, I am gonna maintain here up on this stage that there are three uh, key elements in creating an original pilot that are different than the challenge for you if you're writing a half hour for an existing show. 
Uh, now, can anybody guess what I'm going to say is the number one priority in any pilot? If you do this right, you might just have it. But if you don't do this right, you ain't got nothing. Boom! <laughs> Boom! We heard it right there. Yes, it's the original characters. I know a lot of you were thinking that. You knew it all along. And when you heard it, you knew she was right. Okay. Creating the original character is the first priority of the successful pilot, whether it is comedy or drama. Now, watch what happens to the writer with a reputation who's written for The Simpsons and King of the Hill in The Office. And now I go to do a pilot I've never had to create an original character. I've written for Michael Scott and Homer Simpson and, and Bobby Hill, great characters. I never had to create one. And so in that sense, even successful writers, most of us probably are kind of frauds when they come knocking on our door asking us to write a pilot. We've never created an original character. OK, well, let's do this. Let us. From now on, all of us in this room and watching around the world, let us no longer be frauds. Let us start to have a file in our brains on what makes a great character. OK, uh, now I have a head start here, because I have been thinking about this for a little while. But uh, I think that there are probably people out here who've thought about character. And, and we have a lot of different thoughts about character. I'd like to hear some thoughts about uh, what makes a character, anyone who's, who's tried to create a character or watched one on TV. Is there anything that you've noticed? Yes, my friend. Is active instead of reactive? Uh, a little bit louder, please. Active instead of reactive. Great, great. What a great uh, uh, word that is. Active instead of reactive. Uh, wonderful thing to do with your character. You know, I had lunch with uh, an actor named Paul Lieberstein yesterday. Paul played Toby on The Office. Paul also ran The Office. He was the showrunner for quite a while. Paul is very good with uh, character. And I asked him, I said, I'm going to be up in front of a bunch of writers tomorrow. What makes for a good character? And that is basically what he said. He said when creating a, a character for a show, you want the kind of person who, uh, who uh, has uh, problems that they just have to solve. And even when they solve them, they still want to solve other problems. Now, that's Paul. Paul is thinking very hard about why a main character would activate a show. Active is a great word. Anything else? Any other words that we carry around as we're, uh, as we're uh, creating characters? Yes, in the back. Flawed. Flawed. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. The word flawed. What does this mean? Well, from just the word, uh, I, I imagine you may have worked with actors. Actors are very much looking for what the flaw is in their character. Now, this is uh, at odds uh, in a way with the idea that a character should be likable. We hear that a lot from executives. A character must be likable. But in fact, for performers, there must be some kind of flaw. Now, what do we mean by a flaw, a flaw in a character? Well, that's up to you to figure out, honestly, as a writer, as an artist. Uh, but notice that in the arts, the, the revelation of, uh, of our imperfections, our failures to live up to who we want to be, our failures to be the person we're trying to project that we are, are most interesting to performers, and they're very interesting to viewers. Those are great, great words. Does anyone have anything else that they'd like to contribute here? Yes. I'd like them to be idiosyncratic. I'd like them to mm -hmm. have interesting, sure. not necessarily flaws, but things about them that are different from well, I think that's great. I think that's very important. You know, what you're making me think here is this. I started out as a short story writer. Okay, in some ways, the short story writer is the wrong person to be writing half-hour drama or comedy. Why? Because we're very internal, we're very linguistic, but in fact, in this medium, we are writing for performers. And performers are attracted to quirky, different, interesting, idiosyncratic. That's a great way to go. All right, let me uh, uh, throw a couple ideas at you here that you can put in your, in your little uh, toolkit. Um, a very interesting thing to think about when you are creating a character is, is there a fundamental contrast in this character? Okay? If I say to you, uh, what are the great characters of, uh, of American television? Uh, and I make you all list uh, the top 10, I guarantee you on everybody's list, Tony Soprano is going to be there. Okay? <laughs> Tony Soprano is a great character. Why? He is a contradiction. He's a thug. He's a killer. He's a beast. But he's in therapy. He's sensitive. He's introspective. 
All right? He'd kill you in a second. But for his family, he'd die for them. Okay? Just these contradictions alone, you know you're in with an interesting character. If all you do is program a computer to create a trait and its opposite, you may be able to create a character that is good, playable, and interesting just with that formula alone. Okay, uh, other uh, thoughts on character. Anybody have anything else they'd like to throw in here? Uh, yes, my friend. Uh, desires. Desires, okay, good, good. Uh, tell me more, what do you mean by desires? Uh, you know, what do they want uh -huh. in general in life? Yes. Or, or Yes, 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 so important. Now, I worked on a TV show uh, for ABC, and I am not gonna name this show because it <laughs> failed, okay? Uh, it was built around a charismatic and talented actress uh, who was proven on the stage and uh, in, in movies, and unfortunately, the actress wrote the pilot herself, and she did not include strong goals and drives for herself or the secondary characters. There was a romantic interest in the lead, and that's it. And the writing staff got hired, and we tried to create episodes, and we floundered. And finally, we were like, what do these people want? And we just added things. Well, her best friend always wanted to play cello at Carnegie Hall. Okay, we just added it. Now we could do a story where she gets an opportunity to play in a little theater, okay? You must have desires in order to create stories. So knowing the drives and desires of your characters is essential. That is a great point. I'd like to share something that I picked up from uh, Greg Daniels, one of my favorite writers and a true mentor. He sat next to me at The Simpsons. He created King of the Hill. He created The Office. Greg's a super brain when it comes to uh, all things writing and comedy. Greg, uh, he used to give notes on, on episodes of TV, he still does. He gave the same note so many times, just uh, four words. He gave these four words uh, so many times. He had them carved uh, by a professional wood cutter in the back of a chair that he sits on in his office. Okay? Those words are stakes, motivations, escalations, and twists. Uh, for the purpose of character, let's just take a look at stakes and motivations. Greg distinguished between stakes and motivations. Stakes are what a character stands to win or lose in any episode. I'm trying to make a million dollars, okay? Uh, to, to pay for my uh, daughter's surgery. Those are the stakes. I need the money. I've got to save my daughter. Motivations are totally different, psychological. Motivations are, um, I've got to prove myself to my dad. I'm in, I'm in a baseball game, but my dad always humiliated me. Whether I win or lose, it's the motivation is psychological. I just throw that at you as a, a student of character. We have external and internal goals. These are great ways to think about character. A word that has come up recently when I've been asking this question of good writers, uh, something that I think is so useful to think about uh, in terms of character is what they call the core wound. Uh, now, when I say this, you as writers immediately know what I mean. Don't you? The core wound? What is this thing that this character must solve uh, in order to be whole and happy? If you do not have that in your character, if you do not have that in your pilot, Go back and see if you can put it in. Because isn't it the case that so often when a character works, it's because they have this almost unsolvable emotional, psychological need, which is driving the series, the core wound. OK. Uh, do we have any other thoughts on character before I give you the million dollar insight of uh, my career into creating the comedy character? Anybody have one that they want to uh, drop as an aperitif before uh, I lay this on you? <laughs> All right, good. I've intimidated you into silence. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, you know, we're talking about character, and these are all brilliant insights into character. I'm sure you will come up with many more. Remember that you are writing for actors. Actors like layering, they like depth, they like complexity. Okay, but what happens when you are writing a comedy? Uh, what happens when your character has to be funny? This is the thing which almost no one has ever said anything very useful about in my experience, and I had to learn the hard way. Let me tell you a story. Um, I was uh, hired to do a rewrite of a film uh, that was called Mystery Men. It was a big feature. It was about uh, superheroes with trivial powers. Uh, ben Stiller was hired at the last minute to be the star of this ensemble comedy. He had just done something about Mary, and he was on a hot streak. All right, so they hired him to be in this movie. They're going to shoot it in like eight weeks. And uh, Ben says, I want to hire a writer to uh, punch up the, uh, the script. They say, of course, Ben, whoever you want. 
He remembered me from the Ben Stiller show. He hires me to punch up this movie. Okay, so I work for weeks, uh, writing the jokes, rewriting the jokes, trying to make it funnier, funnier, right? And the day before the table read, where all the executives are going to come, all the actors are going to come, it's at Mr. Chow. It's extremely fancy. The day before this, Stiller calls me up and he says, uh, I'm reading the pages and uh, uh, my character, he's called Mr. Furious. That's his name. Uh, what's funny about my character? What's funny about him? I'm furious? I'm angry all the time? Is that funny? Just being angry all the time? What is funny about that? What is funny about my character? Okay? That's a very intimidating call to get. <laughs> Especially when I don't know. I don't know. I'm supposed to be a professional comedy writer. I got all these credits. I don't know. Okay? So what do I do? I go over to Stiller's apartment, and we sit there, and we just talk for hours. Okay, what could be funny? How could this be funny? And at a certain point, he has a breakthrough. And he says, well, you know, if, uh, if, if I'm wearing like a leather jacket, and I'm trying to be all tough, and uh, I'm trying to act like furious, and I'm trying to seem like I'm a tough guy, but I'm not, that's funny for me to play. I'm a sensitive guy acting like I'm an angry guy. Suddenly, he had something to play, and it was funny. OK, what is this formula? What is going on? I will submit to you that the act of pretending to be one person and coming across as another person is a fundamental, eternal, reliable formula for performance comedy. And if you look at successful comedy characters throughout history, very often, you can reduce their core joke to a single hook, a single performance contradiction between how they're trying to come across and how they're actually coming across. And once I discovered this, uh, I started to see it everywhere. At this time, uh, I was taking lots of meetings with, uh, with feature rewrite people, Universal, Warner Brothers. And I would come in and I would say, well, you know, the secret, of course, is a contradiction between how the person is trying to come across and how they're actually coming across. Look at Inspector Clouseau. He's trying to come across as smart and competent and brilliant, but he's actually coming across as a bumbling fool. Look at Austin Powers. He thinks he's coming across sexy, man, but with the big teeth, he's coming across repulsive. All right, that formula is reliable for creating comedy characters. Uh, when I was hired on uh, The Office, I was asked, well, what's the comedy uh, formula for Michael Scott? And I said, he thinks he's coming across popular. In fact, he's the least popular guy in The Office. <laughs> All right, try that one out for yourselves. As you are trying to create comedy characters, ask yourself, is there a core contradiction of performance where the person is trying to come across one way and actually coming across another. It's a reliable formula for performance comedy. All right, now, I may have mentioned uh, that in my study of the comedy pilot, I've come to believe that there are probably three essential things that a comedy pilot needs to be successful. It might only be two, the main character, as we've said, uh, and the premise. But in fact, uh, there is a third one that I would throw out there. I think if you're looking at the history of successful comedies, there's a second thing, and that is the secondary character. So I'm going to maintain that if you have a great central character that works and is funny, uh, and you have a premise, you probably have a pilot. But in fact, the secondary characters uh, are almost always in them. So let's talk a little bit about secondary characters. Now, this is a little more challenging. Uh, I wonder if anybody has any thoughts uh, watching TV. Is there anything that we're looking for in a secondary character? Are there any thoughts anybody has at all on this one? Rather a challenging question. Yes, my friend. Relatability? Relatability is great. Uh, relatability is great with your main character as well. Uh, I would say yes. You know what? I would say, in fact, uh, if your instinct is to say, well, the secondary characters might as well have the same depth, complexity, contradictions, even performance hook as the main character, that's fine. I think that's great. If we build our secondary characters to be good characters, that's a good thing. Uh, anything else that, uh, yes, in the back. Well, they become your like B and C stories. Excellent, yes, very good point. There we go, so having drives, having goals is gonna be very important, excellent. Uh, over here I saw a hand. Yeah, I'm thinking about like heightening and contrast, like someone who's the opposite of the main character, or someone who's an extreme. Very good. Very good, very good. I love how this uh, dialogue has evolved here. You are all correct. Uh, that last point I'd like to dwell on for a moment because here our writer is saying, why don't we conceive of the secondary character in relation to the protagonist? And that's a very clever thing to think. Uh, you know, the great example of this for me was King of the Hill, uh, created by Greg Daniels and Mike Judge. 
And uh, you know, it started as a cartoon that Mike Judge had done. It was Hank Hill and Bobby, I think, were the, were the main two characters. Greg did quite a bit of work uh, adding the secondary characters. Notice how, if you watch King of the Hill, every one of the secondary characters is specifically designed to trigger the main character. So you have Hank Hill, who is essentially a Texas conservative. He sort of wishes that uh, life had not changed much since 1955. That was a perfect Mike Judge, for those of you who are fans. Uh, he's a conservative. OK. His son, uh, 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 Hank Hill, is a, is a man's man. He wants his son to be a good athlete and have manly values. His son is a kind of pudgy, not a very good athlete, likes video games, is a little sensitive. He's designed to trigger dad. Uh, uh, Hank's wife is a Spanish teacher, thinks of herself as modern, uh, is interested in progressive ideas designed to trigger the main character. Hank's niece is Luann, uh, always in the crop top, uh, super short shorts. She's very sexualized, meant to trigger the very prude Hank Hill. And finally, uh, his father. Uh, Hank is a conservative. His father is 10 times more conservative, triggering Hank as the uh, relative progressive in the relationship. Notice how every one of the characters is designed around the main character. As you are doing your secondary characters, think hard about whether, A, they have the great qualities of, that a main character should, but also how they relate and trigger your central character. That's my main thought on secondary characters. Okay. Now let's talk about the third element uh, that I have come to believe uh, is essential to our list of things that a, an effective pilot needs. I used to go around saying all you need is a great main character. That's how much I esteem the main character. You know, I used to say, uh, look at the character of Mr. Bean, the, uh, the English uh, comic character, right? It's just Mr. Bean. We don't need a premise. It's a whole franchise built around Mr. Bean. So in some ways, it is true that if all you have is one great comic character, maybe you have enough. But I think as professionals, especially those of us trying to sell pilots, uh, we do need to consider this element of the premise. OK, so let's talk about the premise. And the premise has, in fact, uh, evolved a bit. Uh, in TV. What do we mean by the premise? The, the meaning of the word premise, I think, has evolved a bit uh, from the uh, classic days of network television to the modern days of streaming. So what do I mean by that? Okay, let's look at the history of television just a little bit here. Uh, you know, TV, uh, comedy, uh, used to be seen uh, once a week on NBC or once a week on CBS or ABC. And the, the goal was to do 100 episodes of this, all right? Once you did 100 episodes, uh, we, we, uh, in television, we all, we all talked about selling uh, the 100 episodes into syndication. That was the goal of all television writers when I came into the business. 100, sell it into syndication. Okay. So in order to do that, you have to create a premise which has a sort of eternal, unsolvable problem at the center of it so that it continues to generate story kind of forever. Now, an example of this would be uh, Everybody Loves Raymond. When I was on The Office, I worked with a writer named Aaron Schur. Are there any Office fans uh, out there? Uh, anybody ever see uh, 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 Kevin? Uh, falls in his own chili. You ever see that thing? Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Aaron Schur wrote that, okay. So, and Aaron was a writer from Everybody Loves Raymond. And he's a great writer. I said to him, uh, Aaron, what, what made um, Everybody Loves Raymond work? He said, eternal unsolvable problem in the premise. The eternal unsolvable problem is Raymond loves and is loyal to his wife. But he also loves and is loyal to his mom. And the mom and the wife hate each other, OK? It's not solvable. He's there in the middle forever. And that's why you can get 100 episodes out of Raymond. We're looking for that in traditional network TV, in traditional network comedy, where we want it to generate stories forever. But now look what's happened. Uh, we have streaming. And in streaming, a couple of things go on. One is that the audience can watch uh, as many episodes as they want all at once, and they do. We know for sure that the audience is always watching three, four, sometimes five episodes at once, right? They're not waiting a week. They don't have to remember what happened last week. They've seen it. So immediately what you get is serial storytelling, a desire for serial storytelling from the audience, and in fact, a desire for serial storytelling from the buyers. Any of you who have tried to sell or develop TV shows recently with Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, any of them, they're going to use that word serial with you immediately. What is the arc? What is the story we're telling? 
In fact, uh, you'll hear people talking now about when we do an eight uh, episode show, it's kind of like making a four hour movie. It's that different from traditional network TV. Okay, in this new environment, what we mean by the premise very much changes because now we do shows like Only Murders in the Building. That has a totally different definition of premise than Raymond. Raymond was an eternal unsolvable problem. Only Murders in the Building is an actual murder which will be solved by the end of this season, right? It's much more like a movie than it is like traditional TV. Okay, so that is the context of the evolution of the idea uh, of premise. Um, now, uh, an instructive case uh, was told to me uh, recently. Um, a writer I worked with at the office, uh, a guy named Lee Eisenberg, very good writer. Um, I heard from someone who worked with him about the development of the show Search Party. Uh, now, Search Party, I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's basically about uh, uh, four friends. The characters are wonderful. The dialogue is great. The whole tone of the show is very, very interesting and, and, uh, and has so much to admire. Uh, in the early version of Search Party, it was just uh, four guys in a coffee shop who are jerks to each other. <laughs> and the characters were funny. They were great. The characters were developed, as I understand it, with uh, comic performers in mind who helped develop it and, and lent voice and little quirks and, uh, and a tone to it. And everybody loved this pilot about these four guys who give each other shit in a coffee shop. But no one would buy it. No one would make it because they said, it isn't really a show, OK? What did it need? It needed a premise. Now look at this. They literally, according to Lee Eisenberg, who apparently gets credit for having thought of this, they just added a premise to that and said, what if one of their friends has gone missing and they're trying to solve a little bit of a mystery of, of what happened to this guy? So the, the show was great in terms of its characters, but could not get off the ground until it had that premise added. Okay, so that is, uh, in the modern sense now, what we mean by a premise. Um, now, premise for me is something I'm really thinking a lot about now. I wonder if anybody has any, any uh, thoughts on premise. Those of you who have written pilots, I saw a lot of hands go up. Uh, can you tell me, has anybody had an experience uh, of changing their premise? Uh, of trying to find a premise that fits the characters. Does anybody have anything that they the, the, can contribute uh, about premise here at all? It's a really high level question. Okay, let me then contribute uh, uh, a story of my own. Okay, um, recently I was contacted by an actor to develop a show um, and the actor had the bare bones of a character. Uh, the character, he said, he wanted to, uh, to play a musician, a singer-songwriter, okay? Now, I know this uh, actor. He's very funny, a very funny performer. I also know that singing is a great way to energize comedy, something we learned for sure on The Office. Mindy Kaling was one who <laughs> discovered if you can put a song in it, it's going to energize the comedy. Now I have an actor, a performer, who wants to do comedy. He wants to play a singer-songwriter. He knows that's going to energize it. This is where we begin. Okay, now. As you know, I feel like the first issue is character. What is the backstory? What is the complexity? What is the depth of this character? We talk about the character. Uh, we get interested in the idea that the singer-songwriter is in fact uh, the son of a successful singer-songwriter from the 70s. He himself, not so successful. Like a John Lennon, Julian Lennon kind of thing, okay? Uh, now my character is an underdog with a core wound. He wants to validate himself. He's in the shadow of his father. Okay, it's getting deeper. What is funny about this character? Well, he's going around with his sunglasses on, acting like the paparazzi are photographing him when they're not. He's trying to come across as if he's famous and successful when he's not. Now I have a hook. I have something comic to play. Okay, it seems to be working. The actor is liking it. We talked to a director. The director is liking it. But it isn't getting bought. It isn't moving forward. There is a feeling like you don't have a show yet. Okay, why? I have the character. I begin to now explore secondary characters. Uh, he has a half-brother. Uh, he, he was uh, the son of the first wife. His half-brother is the son of the second wife, the young model that his dad left his mom for. The young brother inherited all the money. His brother is rich 
he is poor. He, I'm developing new characters. I'm starting to fill out the world. I still, still do not have the show until I have the premise. Okay. So here was the breakthrough for me. And this is the breakthrough that you might have in your own development of a comedy uh, pilot when you feel like you're liking the characters, but you don't yet have the premise. Here was the premise that broke through. Uh, I said, uh, our singer-songwriter, with his big chip on the shoulder, his need for validation, his need to come out from the shadow of his father, uh, is so down on his luck, so needs money, that one day he decides to make a choice. He gets out an old notebook, and he fakes a bunch of songs, pretending that they were written by his father. He pretends to find a songbook written by his dad and goes out with it to Rolling Stone and says, I found these songs from my famous dad. And then he goes and records them with Lady Gaga and Paul Simon. And he gets nominated for a Grammy. And so he goes with his lie uh, on a fame ride, but always with the lie hanging over him like the sword of Damocles, what will happen when he's found out. That was the turning point in the enthusiasm for the actor, the director, and the buyers. And knock wood, we'll believe it when the ink is dry, but it seems like that was the breakthrough from having a character to selling a pilot. For that reason, I say that when you are trying to create your pilot, maybe your fundamentals are two or three things. Great character, secondary characters, and premise that activates your character. Okay. That, my friends, uh, is my attempt to share with you uh, what I know about this craft. Uh, and now I'm going to check uh, how much time we have left because in our remaining time, I want to drill it home by talking about successful pilots. Uh, uh, we have uh, 15 minutes by my calculation. And here's what I would like to do. You know, I promised something, didn't I? What did I promise? Lively, right? Interactive? All right, let's do this. Let's get lively and let's get interactive, people, by talking about uh, uh, five pilots. Uh, we have 15 minutes, so we've got to do it quick, but let's run through some pilots here that worked. Not all pilots of successful shows are good pilots. I don't think the pilot of Seinfeld is anywhere near as good as that show becomes. But some pilots are good. Some pilots are still referred to by professional writers as being the best of the best. And we're going to talk about three classics here, and then time permitting, two new ones. OK, so first classic, uh, one that people talk about all the time to this day as, uh, as being almost unbeatable is the pilot of Cheers. Uh, are there any fans of Cheers in this audience? Would you, my friend, come up to the stage? Give this uh, writer a big hand, please. Uh, it takes a lot of courage to come on a stage. And, uh, this writer cannot go wrong, because we are going to have a little convo about Cheers. Uh, first of all, my friend, I will give you this microphone. Hi. And will you tell us your name? Mia Rivera. Mia, uh, thank you for having the character and the courage to get up in front of these writers. Honestly, I didn't, I thought you were just asking. Oh, I ambushed you completely. Let's not be, uh, let's not kid ourselves. This was an absolute prank on you. OK. Um, let's, let's talk about Cheers. Um, do you remember the pilot of Cheers at all? Yes. Um, tell me what you, what you remember about the pilot. I remember that Diane came in the uh, bar. Yes. Waiting for her fiance. Yes. And they were going to go off and get married, but he never came. Yes, it's a great story. Guys, the story is awesome. A woman is dumped at the altar, uh, <laughs> and they do it all in, in a bar. Uh, and she goes from sort of snobbly, like I would never step into this place, to ultimately taking a job there, right? Yes. Great. We have a great arc for, for the main character. Now, do you remember the actual opening of Cheers? I've watched it recently, so I have an advantage over you. You have a lot of advantages. <laughs> Let's just be honest. OK, well, let me, let me tell you what the opening is. And I'm going to maintain that the, the way this thing opens is what we might call the classic opening of uh, a pilot. It happens three times here in three successful pilots. The opening of Cheers is Sam alone at the bar. A kid comes in and tries to uh, put a fake ID over on him. And Sam gets some witticisms off. Hey, you know, uh, you've seen a lot of uh, war out there. What was war like? War is gross. You know, he gets some jokes off uh, that way. And we see the character of Sam, the comic character, is on display without any other characters there. It's basically an opening comic set piece featuring the protagonist of the show. After that, uh, we open up uh, on the bar and the secondary characters come in. One after another, the secondary characters are introduced. And once they are introduced, then we get the premise of woman jilted, she will end up joining the cast. So what is the formula? Opening comedy set piece featuring the protagonist, fairly alone. Okay, no secondary characters. 
then introduction of secondary characters, and then the premise. Uh, thank you for joining me to talk about Cheers. Big hand for this courageous writer. It's been my pleasure. <laughs> All right. Uh, the second uh, pilot that I want to uh, talk to you about uh, is the pilot of New Girl. Are there any fans of New Girl in this audience? Oh, now we're reluctant to clap because we might get uh, picked up on stage here. Uh, in that case, I would just ask for any courageous volunteer to join me on the stage. We're trying to keep it lively. We're trying to keep it interactive. Give a big hand for this writer coming to the stage. It's true, I have all the advantages. I recently watched all of these pilots and know exactly what I want to hear. But it's interactive, right? It's lively. Welcome, my friend. Can you tell us your name? I'm Augie. Augie, welcome. It takes uh, true guts to get up on stage. Uh, and it's the kind of guts that we need as artists and writers. Uh, OK, what do, we, uh, what do you remember about New Girl? Uh, the girl moves into an apartment with three guys. Yes, yes, absolutely. And on, very good. And by the way, that is pretty much what the premise of that pilot is. You know, it's, uh, uh, I, I highly encourage all of you, if you haven't done it already, you can go online and get um, uh, Liz Merriweather's treatment of uh, the show. It is freaking great. Basically, she just writes in the first person, uh, you know, all my life I've had better friends who are guys than girls. I don't know what it is about me. You know, maybe uh, I just can't open up to girls. Maybe I'm jealous. I don't know. It's absolutely in her voice. The treatment, there's no attempt at formality at all. And it's very intimate, and it conveys really what the show is. Uh, a girl who gets along with guys better, and her moving in is the premise of that pilot for sure. OK, uh, let me ask you. Uh, you can go back and, and watch this. I encourage all of you to watch Cheers, New Girl, and Brooklyn Nine-Nine, which I'll talk about. Uh, you can watch them all on YouTube if you want. Do you remember the opening of, uh, of New Girl at all? No. OK, I wouldn't expect you to. Uh, the opening is the same formula as Cheers. We open on a comedy set piece featuring the main character. So in this case, uh, Jess is her name. Uh, we start with her. She's uh, in a taxi. She's going on a date. Uh, with. Uh, she's showing up at her boyfriend's house. Uh, by surprise, she's going to show up on the anniversary of their one year of dating, and she's going to do a little strip tee. She's got like a bow tie around her, and she's going to be completely naked. And uh, she does a little silly kind of dance. And then the boyfriend comes out, and he's dating another woman. She's uh, being cheated on. That's the opening sequence. It is a comedy set piece that showcases the main character alone, without the secondary characters. Uh, after that, do you know what happens in the pilot? No. OK. Uh, that's uh, why would he? Uh, then what happens is precisely what you said. She goes and, um, and meets this group of young people who are looking for a new roommate, and she auditions to be their new roommate. Uh, and we land exactly on the premise that you're talking about. So what is the formula? Opening comedy set piece showing the main character, uh, meet secondary characters, and then once we've met secondary characters, we go into the premise of the show. Thank you to this young man. Thank you for joining us on stage. There we go. All right, the third uh, uh, pilot uh, that we can talk about here, which is uh, a follower of the same classic formula, uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Uh, do we have any more people who, d oh, 10 minutes, thank you. Uh, okay, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Anybody uh, uh, dare to come up on stage and talk about Brooklyn Nine-Nine? Have I ruined the whole idea of interactivity? We've just left with Lively. No, we've got interactive, come up on stage. the courage of these artists. Just coming up here in front of you, tremendous character. Hello, my friend. What do you call yourself? Alicia. Hi, Alicia. Um, OK, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, what do we uh, remember about this show? What's good about it? Um, I remember the opening is Peralta and Santiago. Uh -huh. And so they established their dynamic really quickly because yes. they're both trying to solve a case. Nice. Whoa, there's a fan. <laughs> Brilliant. OK, Peralta and Santiago, she even knows the, uh, the names of the characters. Uh, it's Andy Samberg, and I forget the name of the actress. Melissa, oh my gosh, Romero. Okay, great, okay, great. Yes, once again, it's a comedy set piece. This time, uh, we begin with, uh, with uh, Sandberg and his, uh, and his uh, uh, female colleague in, uh, at Brooklyn Nine-Nine. They're both cops, and they're investigating uh, a, a crime, and it's a comedy set piece. It's basically, Sandberg is kind of uh, goofing around during the investigation. It's, it's a, a robbery of an electronics store. He plays a little Casio uh, uh, 
keyboard. He's goofing around. He makes some jokes. Oh, he's got a teddy bear with a camera in it. And he makes some jokes about Officer Teddy. Okay, we're showcasing his character, the goof around guy in the police force who still gets things done. So opening set piece, showcasing the uh, comic talents, the main hook of the main character. Uh, and then we go into, uh, do you remember how the uh, pilot itself starts after the cold open? Yeah, well, I think they go back to the precinct and they're supposed to be getting a new um, like chief. Yes. Um, and so he uh, makes a bad impression and so yes. the pilot is on his, you know, trying to get back into the good place. Absolutely right. We, we showcase the core conflict of that pilot is between Sandberg's goof around character and a new chief who's very much by the books. That's the threat of it. Uh, what you'll notice if you watch that pilot is opening comedy set piece, then a very nice introduction of secondary characters as the chief, who's a new guy in the office, is, is told about each of the secondary characters. A great way to introduce your secondary characters is have them describe to a new character coming in. But it follows the same formula. Showcase comedy uh, uh, star, introduce secondary characters, follow the uh, premise of the pilot. Thank you very much for coming on stage. Well done. Uh, very impressed by the character of, uh, of the artist who would come up and do that. Um, all right, in our final couple of minutes here, uh, let's talk about two modern pilots. What I was trying to uh, hammer home there is there is something which you could call the classic comedy formula, okay? Uh, uh, set piece about your main character, introduce secondary characters, do your story. Um, but uh, in the modern TV landscape, uh, we are noticing significant evolutions of that classic form. Uh, two shows, which you, if you haven't seen them, go see these shows if you can, because they're both successful and they're both variations on the form. One is Hacks. Uh, I believe there's a writer from Hacks coming up, be on the stage later. You guys can ask him about this. Uh, Hacks, very good show. It is different. Um, what's different about it is um, it leaves uh, the traditional main stage of a comedy. You know, we typically do our comedies on one kind of area, the precinct at Brooklyn Nine-Nine, the office at the office. Um, not the case in Hacks, which feels uh, cinematic. It's leaving. It's going from location to location. Um, what works about Hacks? Uh, does anybody have an idea of the core of what works about Hacks? Anybody want to try to say it? I love it. I love it. I would say you're, you're saying almost precisely how I would have articulated it. It lives and dies on the two main characters. Uh, notice how they are generationally different. They're temperamentally different. In fact, they really don't want to be with each other. Okay? And that's fun. Uh, they are both uh, down and out and in need. It's a young comedian who's been canceled for a tweet and an older comedian who's becoming irrelevant. They need each other, though they don't want to be together. That alone really can drive a pilot, a simple, great relationship between two characters which starts in conflict and we know is going to end up in partnership. A great one to watch. The final one uh, that I would point out is uh, Only Murders in the Building. That's the one where you really notice that although it has the same bones that we typically have in a comedy, which is to say uh, it's built on character, three characters in particular uh, who, are, who are different from each other, this is the one where we're adding that modern feeling of premise, where instead of an eternal uh, dynamic that we're playing out week after week, we have a specific premise, literally a murder, that must be solved by the end of the uh, eight episodes. Uh, I have an inside story for you uh, about uh, only murders in the building. Apparently, this was a premise and a script that Steve Martin had for years. And it was originally about three old guys uh, who live in a building and they're kind of tired. They like uh, uh, murders and murder mysteries, but uh, they're, they're really uh, not very energetic. And so the title, Only Murders in the Building, referred to the fact that these old guys don't want to leave the building. We're only going to solve murders in the building. Now suddenly the title makes sense, right? In a way that it doesn't make sense now with Selena Gomez. Isn't that funny, though? That's how thoroughly a premise can evolve and still retain its old title. But apparently, until they added the multi-generational element, there wasn't enough enthusiasm, presumably, to get it made. All right, there we have it. Uh, uh, some classic uh, looks at the pilot and some modern evolutions. Um, you guys have been a phenomenal a group of writers. You did exactly what we claimed we were going to do here, which was act like writers, support each other, and share the knowledge that we've acquired with each other. Can we continue to do that as we 
stride this globe of ours. When we meet other writers, let's meet them as uh, fellows. Let us share what we know. Let us be craftspeople who are generous to each other. And let's have a feeling of some kind of unity as writers, especially under the umbrella of this wonderful Writers Guild. Uh, I thank you guys uh, very much. Uh, if you like the Brenty experience here, you know, I've become completely addicted to uh, interacting with uh, young writers and trying to teach what I know. Uh, the only place you can ever find me, however, is brentforrester.com. Uh, I'm not on any social media. My mom uh, hated TV, and she inspired in me kind of a suspicion of technology. So I'll only be on brentforrester.com. But check it out. I'm uh, teaching classes occasionally. Uh, come find me, and uh, I will see you guys again uh, very soon. Thanks, guys.